Welcome everybody to this week's uh, eLearning Designers Academy live or eLearning Career Chats. I haven't yet figured out exactly what I'm calling these, but uh, <laughs> thank you so much for coming today. It, before I let Kim introduce herself, if this is your first time coming to one of these sessions, um, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. So first, uh, the sessions are completely unstructured. So Kim and I, we've literally only been talking for the past couple of minutes, uh, but we haven't had any previous conversations really about what we're talking about. So it's an organic conversation. And then the second thing I want to mention too is in addition to participating in chat, introducing yourself, you'll notice in the top that there is a questions pod and, or a questions tab. It's a little, uh, uh, has a little question mark there. You can click there and submit any questions you have for myself or for Kim, really about anything career related, moving from academia to instructional design, whatever the case might be. And once we're about halfway through, we will uh, start tackling those questions. So, hey, Kim, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. Now, remind me, where are you joining from? Where are you at, uh, like geographically? I'm You're in San Diego, San Diego, California. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Well, I'm in Phoenix, so just a few hours. Oops, just a few yeah. hours away from yeah. from San Diego. Good. A little well, bit hotter, but close. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot bit hotter. Trust me. <laughs> I'm like melting here. It's really hot right now. Um, so why don't we do this? Uh, just take a moment, introduce yourself, uh, tell everybody a little bit about what you do for a living and and uh, kind of your journey into instructional design, and, and we'll kind of go from there. Absolutely. So I'm Kim Denton. I am a learning experience designer, um, instructional designer, and curriculum specialist at Intuit here in San Diego. And um, so before I went into that corporate environment, though, I spent quite, quite a good chunk of time doing curriculum and instruction design and instructional coaching and teaching itself in academia, mm. both in uh, school environments and also in university environments as teaching assistant in private school. Yep adults as a, as a language instructor. So that's a little bit about what I'm doing now and a quick snapshot um, about my background. Um, I guess if I were to go way back to the beginning of the journey, mm -hmm. hello everybody, I'm loving seeing the, the welcomes in the chat. Yeah, hi. Um, let me just give you a quick recap since yeah. we're talking about the journey from academia to corporate. So sure. um, let's go way back to the beginning. Uh, I discovered my passion for teaching in undergrad at the University okay. of Colorado. So I was a psychology major there and uh, CU has a gigantic psychology department. Hmm. Um, and so my focus was on neuropsychology and cognitive psychology, which really came in handy as I went into teaching, right? Sure. Um, they had these gigantic lecture halls for the, the lower level classes, the freshmen and sophomore that fill, you know, there are 350 people in there. And so what the school does is, uh, you know, every year they select a few upperclassmen, upperclass women to be assistant teachers to the professors mm. of those gigantic classes. And so I was selected to be one of those. And that's where I got my first taste of of really good teaching. It was with the freshmen and sophomore students. And so as the uh, teacher's assistant, you lead one to two, they call them recitation sections per week where you're doing kind of mini lectures, you grade the essays, grade the quizzes, do test prep, have office hours. I really sure. liked that so much so that I took a job at the tutoring center there at the university. Okay. And, uh, and, and I also uh, took a job uh, teaching part-time um, science club after school at the elementary schools in town. Okay. So I caught the bug there, um, graduated with my BA in psychology, got my teaching certificate and teaching license, and went on to start as a fourth grade teacher. Go Buffs! Oh, wow. I, see, I see an alumni <laughs> in the chat. Go Buffs! Um, so I started teaching fourth grade. Um, yeah. Loved it. A uh, couple years down the road, I decided to go back to school, went to grad school and got a master's in curriculum and instruction. Okay. So that's really kind of where formal training and in instructional design began. Yeah. Um, uh, not as we're calling it in, in the capacity of corporate instructional design, sure. but in sort of that deeper layer of, um, you know, what to teach, when to teach, yep. how to sequence it, all of that. So I did that master's in curriculum and instruction started specializing in literacy instruction um, and continued as a fourth grade teacher. 
And then I moved to San Diego. And when I got here, I was transferring all of my teaching licenses over to the state of California from Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I took a job teaching adults again. Okay. Uh, this time it was at a, a private language school here in San Diego for um, Europeans and, and, and Asians, mostly uh, traveling here to study English, business English and conversational English. So okay. I got back into teaching adults. Um, and then I saw my uh, dream job at the time pop up. Um, and that was to uh, to work at this superstar district we have here with a bunch of superstar teachers supporting the transition from a traditional um, curriculum approach, which is kind of that stand and deliver, mm -hmm. um, to what we call a workshop model. And yep. so teachers out there, you're going to really know what I'm talking about. And so are my corporate trainers, right? Yeah. This is where that comes together. Um, so I took that position supporting that transition as a specialist um, in, in literacy and loved it. It was my yeah. dream job because I got to really closely collaborate with these amazing teachers, my own team internally, and then cross, we deploy out to the classroom teachers mm -hmm. and work with them closely on looking at assessment data and how to plan that sort of human student centered instruction to meet the needs we saw. And I brought my toolkit there to, to help specialize that instruction according to what we saw as need. And then I also got to still work with the students. So it was a win win for me. Sure. Um, so a few years after that, I was on a trip to the Philippines with a dear friend oh, of wow. mine who's in corporate. And we were there doing a volunteer project, um, a community literacy initiative, mm -hmm. uh, where we started a library and we, you know, uh, planted flowers at the school. And then I was doing a week of professional development with the teachers at the school. Sure. And on that trip, my friend who's in corporate planted the seed. Mm. She said, hmm, she was taking care of, you know, not the professional development training. She'd pop in and watch. And she said, you know, we in corporate have a lot of training workshops. And one of our best trainers, in her opinion, is a former classroom teacher. Um, have you ever thought about doing that? Um, so she planted the seed. I was still loving my dream job. Mm -hmm. I decided not to, to, to follow that. But I um, went back to grad school, got a second master's degree, this time focusing on really leadership and deep assessment, evaluation of data sure. um, that needs analysis, right? And taking that data to, to find the gap yep. in our student performance versus where we wanted them. And then designing instruction with my colleagues to really close that gap. And so um, I continued doing that, used my new knowledge from my new masters, my my new license um, that sort of enabled me to give advice and um, to evaluate curriculum at a district level mm -hmm. and a county level. Um, and so I was enjoying my dream job for many, many years until like all things that came to an end and uh, the funding ran out <laughs> <laughs> for, for that extra position as yeah. happens sometimes. Um, so, you know, I, I loved that for about a decade, really. Um, and, uh, and the funding ran out there. So I came to a crossroads mm -hmm. and I could either go back into the classroom as a generalist. Um, sure. there were a couple of positions there offered to me. I could leave that district that I loved and go to another one as a, a literacy coach, uh, which I was licensed for. However, it would have entailed just due to funding, me bouncing around to several schools, which is the norm. And mm -hmm. where I was, I was in the same school every day. And it really allowed me to build those relationships over sure. the years with my, my, my colleagues that I was peer coaching and, um, and really get to know the students we were working with over their career. And it just didn't appeal to me to bounce around and give training workshops. Um, yeah teachers. And so I decided to diversify my skills and explore this field of instructional design, knowing that it could lead to corporate, military, um, or maybe, you know, academia in a different, in a different arena. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so that's how I that's how I got there. And then I enrolled in grad school again because I love school, I guess. So <laughs> I get teased for that. You know what I love is knowledge. I just think knowledge is power. Yeah. Yeah, um, for sure. So I enrolled in some graduate classes in instructional design and started on that journey there. Yeah. Um, and I'd be happy to tell you more about it. But. Yeah, no, that's very cool. So it sounds like, real, so real quickly, I, I, a bunch of other people have joined us since we started. So real quickly, for those of you who have questions for Kim about that transition from uh, from teaching academia into instructional design, corporate instructional design, feel free to put your questions in the questions tab up above, and then we'll be tackling those here in a little bit. Um, and you can upvote on other people's questions too. Um, so Kim, it sounds like, it sounds like your transition into instructional design wasn't something it almost doesn't sound like it was intentional it kind of just like slowly evolved into that through your career progression from being in the classroom to doing the um uh what you were doing with uh uh language teaching and then and then out of happenstance, because the funding ran out, it forced you to reevaluate what you were going to do. And and that seed was planted however long ago. So yep. let me ask you this. So when you look back at like when you got your degree, uh, it was in curriculum and what else was it called? Curriculum and what? Uh, curriculum and instruction was, okay. uh, was the first one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, at that time, was the prospect of corporate instructional design at all on your radar? Not at all. I mean, you know, that that first master's was in the early 2000s. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did my, my bachelor's in the 90s, right? Sure. Early 2000s. No, you know, I, I, I chose to do that because I found in my classroom that um, there were just problems I didn't know how to solve. And I really wanted to be better educated and better skilled at how yeah. I could solve the gaps I was seeing in my students' uh, literacy, which I felt is foundational to their entire education. And so I chose to take a really deep dive into that topic so that I would have a bigger toolkit. Sure. So let me ask you this. So when that funding ran out and you uh, you were no longer in that dream job position and you were forced to reevaluate, like when you look back on that retrospectively, are you happy that the funding ran out? Or how do you, like, how do you feel about that now? How do you process feel... that now? I, th I, I feel like that, yes, I'm very happy about it. I'm very yeah. happy about it. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed the work I was doing. I had, like I said, continued to sort of specialize in that field and that second degree in license I did really got more into looking at things the way I look at it now as, as an instructional designer at a, at a very high level, like that front end analysis work, mm -hmm. that heavy data analysis and uh, data driven instructional planning yeah. design. And so I, I was really enjoying that part of the work. Um, and, but I had been doing it for, for quite a while. So at first I was, I was, you know, not happy about it uh, because sure, of I was course. in that position. Uh, yeah. However, it, it forced me to look at, okay, what would I like to do? Do I want to go back into the classroom or do I want to uh, explore a new path? And I am a bit of an explorer by nature, right? Yeah. I love to travel, yeah. I've been all over the world. And so I, I chose to embark on that journey knowing that I could return. Sure. Yeah. If, if I, if I wanted to. So I, I did have that. Um, and, uh, and I, I, I'm happy with my choice. I'm loving my job. I've loved the projects that I've had. It's, there's so much variety. Yeah. Um, well, I think, so I think what's so powerful, the lesson in that, and I think that's such a great attitude to have because I think, um, the lesson to be learned in that is that like in that moment, you know, when you lost your dream job, it probably felt horrible and you were probably like, what the heck am I going to do? And, but like the, the, the attitude you seem to have about it is it was an opportunity for you to pivot and reevaluate re what you wanted to do and redirect your energy moving forward. Maybe not in the direction you thought you were going, but in a different direction. And it ended up being a good thing as a result of it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It reminds me, um, uh, early in my career, uh, 
Uh, many people know this. I've t- I tell this story all the time. I, you know, my first instructional design job was at Kohl's department stores, and I, I worked there in training at their corporate office. And uh, I actually, I don't think I've told a lot of people actually how I ended up leaving Kohl's. So in 2012, I ended up, I was at their corporate office from 2009 to 2012 doing instructional design. And in 2012, after the, the, the market crash, the housing bubble burst, uh, a couple of years after that, it started affecting brick and mortar retail. And I was working at uh, in the department of the new store, uh, new store and remodel team. So our team was responsible for opening uh, new stores and remodeling existing stores. And at that point, I had left the loss prevention department and all that good stuff. And at that at that time, Kohl's totally stopped building new stores. Uh, not completely, but they really significantly slowed down. at At the time, they were opening like a hundred stores a year. Um, and then they obviously were slowing down on remodeling stores and my job got eliminated. And uh, luckily I was fortunate that even though my job got eliminated, they offered me a different position, uh, but it was like in the finance department as like a business analyst had nothing to do with training or e-learning. And I remember thinking, heck no, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that, it'd be miserable. And uh, in at the moment, at the moment, at the time, it was so, scary because I was comfortable. I was enjoying what I was doing. And I thought, what the heck am I going to do? But when I look back on that retrospectively, that moment of freaking out and going, what am I going to do? Uh, being eliminated, having my job eliminated and being pushed outside my comfort zone, having to leave Kohl's and go get an e-learning job or instructional design job somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, that was the thing that allowed me to really propel my career because I realized I wasn't beholden to Kohl's or that wasn't the only option. And so I, the reason I tell that story and it, it reminds me of the one you said is because I think people need to realize like, you know, we've, we, you and I were talking a moment ago before we started about all the teachers looking to get into our industry. And I think a lot of teachers, you know, uh, those who are transitioning out of or wanting to transition out of the classroom because the last year and a half with COVID and everything that's been thrown at them has been horrible. And a lot of them are going to come out of this burnt out and probably more cynical than they were about uh, the way they're treated and their jobs. But for those who choose to use it as an opportunity to redirect that energy towards something better, I I think they'll look back on it as a positive thing because they got pushed outside their comfort zone. Right. I don't know. What do you think about that? I completely agree. It's funny. Our stories are similar in that way, right? It's that particular position ended and there were other positions in that same sort of territory, right? In that same place. Like you said, you could be a business analyst and I could go back into the generalist classroom, but I just, you know, I, I believe in following your passion and your interests and I just wasn't feeling that. Um, And so, no, I, I think that that's a wonderful way to look at it. I also think that it's it's worth a try. I, I always say with any big transition, just because you decided to try it, you can stop at any mm-hmm. time, yep. right? Give it a try. See if it continues to fuel your energy and your interest. And um, if you decide, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going back into the university, I'm going back into the classroom or whatever it may be you could, this is the way I saw it. You could take those new skills with you, right. Mm -hmm. And be better at that job and be better at that job. Yeah. Um, Just like my, you know, the, the, the graduate degrees I did while I was in academia were, were for the purpose of being better at that type of work I was doing. So I would say, if you're wondering, explore, go for it. Worst thing that could happen is you get some new skills that you can parlay into, into the work that you are more comfortable doing and want to go back to. I love that. Yeah, the worst, I, I, I play this, I've talked about this before, but I play the what if game. Every time I'm doing something that feels risky or I'm worried I'm gonna fail, I play the what if game. And the what if game is I go, okay, well, what if it doesn't work out? I might have to go get a job. What if, Or what if it doesn't work out? I might have to go update my resume or I might need to take on more freelance work or you just play the what if game and, and, and talk yourself off that crazy ledge. But I think, you know, it's, and it's so hard when, when somebody is desperately trying to figure out what the heck they're doing or they're in between jobs or they're, they're taking on the risk of changing careers and learning new skills, which are all very scary things. But, uh, I, this is going to sound so woo-woo, uh, and I'm not a religious person by any means, but I do think in those moments, you have to sit and listen and go, what is the universe trying to teach you in that moment? Or what direction is it trying to pull you in? 
and follow it. Cause usually uh, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day and who was, who's trying to transition out of teaching and into e-learning. And she was saying how over her head, she feels over in over her head. Mm -hmm. And she's like considering just signing for next year's contract to go back into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I told her, I'm like, you got to do what you got to do, of course, to pay your bills and your livelihood. But mm -hmm. if you choose to stick with it and stay outside your comfort zone, it's usually where the magic happens. It's where you grow. You know what I mean? Yes, I love that. That is where the magic happens. It is where it grows. And, you know, it's called growing pains for a reason. Yes, because um, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts a little bit sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the road less traveled is a bumpy journey sometimes. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not a smooth path. Uh, so it really depends on what feels right for you. But I would encourage people to, to go for it. And in terms of signing the next year's contract, I, I completely understand that. When my friend planted the seed about corporate training, I said to her, you know, that is interesting. Uh, the problem is the timing with the way that district contracts are done. Oh, it's yeah. a very small window of time uh, that you could explore that. Uh, otherwise, I would have to be dishonest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and not tell uh, corporations that I would interview with that, um, you know, I'm going to try this out. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, if you don't, you know, I don't know, I might change my mind and just sign this contract. Or I would have to leave in the middle of the year. And that feels like abandoning my teammates and my. So I was in that position. So I understand that for teachers who are working in districts. So what I would say to you is when I enrolled in those early courses uh, at uh, the University of Indiana and the University of Maryland, I was trying those two out. Um, in instructional design, I was still doing my 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 day job. Yep. And yep. so I explored that territory in that way. I, I thought, okay, let's take a look at this. It, it sounds to me like it's very closely tied to a great deal of the work I have done in my previous education um, with curriculum and instruction, and then the you know the data analysis and leadership uh, curriculum evaluation work. Mm -hmm. um, let's see how different it is. So that's where I really started putting my toe in the water. Yep. Is this really different or is it similar? And am I interested in it? And I was doing that while I was still under contract. Oh, wow. Okay. And then I made the decision at the end of that contract year, um, continued sort of through those two months of summer. And I, you know, really appreciated the offers to come back into the classroom, but I had, I'd sort of decided I committed to this path and I decided to continue yeah. with it. It reminds me, this is totally different context, but I did something similar when I was, um, before I, before I quit my job, my full-time job and started my own business, this was back in 2019, uh, mm -hmm. which feels like it was yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it'll be, it'll be what, three years this year, which is crazy yeah. or no. Yeah. I, I can't remember, but, um, uh, I remember I was about to go on a two week holiday from Christmas to New Year's and I was still working at my full time job and I had a really, really bad week that week. I remember it was just an awful week headed into the holidays and I always take the two weeks off from Christmas to New Year's if I can. And so I remember telling myself, OK, during these two weeks, I'm shutting off my email and I'm going to explore what it feel like. I'm going to put myself in the mindset of how would this feel if I actually quit my job and I was freelancing full time. And I spent that two weeks redesigning my portfolio and putting myself in that mindset just to see what it would feel like and be like. And it felt so good. And that's how I knew it was it was the right decision for me at that time to make that leap. But the thing I always tell people is like when you're going back to what we were saying earlier about getting outside your comfort zone, um, you know, however you choose to do that, you know you're doing the right thing when you have those feelings, everybody has experienced this, when you're outside your comfort zone and all you, all your instinct is telling you to turn around and go back to your safe spot, that your previous job, your wherever you were at, you know, your previous role, because it's a known quantity, right? Even if you hate the job, it's a known quantity. And if you, when you have that feeling, it, you know you're doing the right thing by continuing to move forward because that's the growing pain. It hurts. It's scary. And so when you have those feelings of, oh, I want to turn around and go back to my comfort zone or my safe spot, then you know you're doing the right thing because it means you're growing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's hard. It's hard to push through that and keep moving forward when everything in your fight, fight or flight instinct tells you to run back to what you know, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I would say anybody who's looking at making this transition, be be prepared for it not to be easy. Really be prepared to 
put in the work. Um, mm -hmm. I would be careful about any, you know, Tim, you and I were talking just a little bit before we came on. I, I was really happy to participate in this conversation with you because I, I feel protective of of my 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 teacher brethren right and <laughs> yeah and i want them to know uh you know to to be careful about anyone who's promising you an easy path uh, you don't oh you don't need education in in instructional design to do this no nobody has it now that's the vast majority of people that are currently in these roles don't have that that formal background in yeah. curriculum and instruction and, uh, you know, instructional analysis, you know, all of that. They don't, most don't have that. Right. Um, I think because it's a fairly new field and the people who are established in it now were just parlayed into that for being good at their job. Yep. Um, That's and me. they figured out, <laughs> yeah, right. It's common. Yeah. They figured out how yeah. to teach. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means that that's not a valid path to take. And so no, I would not at all. caution um, I would caution teachers to be careful to to really vet, um, you know, their choices. And in in my particular case, I chose to do a hybrid of uh, traditional education at a graduate level university, and I supplemented what was missing there for me mm -hmm. with with self education. And and what was missing for me was the the tools of the trade. Yep. Right. Yep. So there was a there was too much theory uh, and not enough practical application. I felt in some of the graduate school classes. Now we needed to do our assignments using a lot of the free tools beyond and Powtoons mm -hmm. and you know Audacity for the podcast and all of those things, but but not really sort of like the top level tools like Storyline, right? Yep. Like yep. Activate, like Camtasia. So as I was um taking those courses and watching job ads what i did was pay attention to the tools that were required for jobs that interested me because yeah. i knew i had this very strong curriculum and instruction foundation and so i took notice of the pattern in the tools uh, noted what those tools were and i got them and i started learning them and then i sought out opportunities to build with them and do freelance work um, volunteer work, even um, a competition, uh, so that I could build with them, put it out mm -hmm. there in the world, and get feedback. That's awesome. And so I would say go for it, um, but be careful of anybody who's promising you a quick fix. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. And um, I, you know, if anyone who's watching this, I would encourage you to go check out um, Kara North has been doing a series of videos on YouTube talking about uh, questions to ask or. Uh, red flags to watch out for when you're signing up for a program or whatever the case might be. And I can't, I can't agree with that more because um, any program that's promising you a job or that you're going to make a certain dollar amount or that you're going to learn storyline in a couple of days, or you you're going to learn storyline for full storyline training for uh, 10 bucks. It's mm -hmm. if it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Yes. <laughs> uh, and um, it's hard because I think for a lot of people desperate to get into this industry, which I think is fantastic that there's people wanting to get into this industry, but people who are desperate, they don't know how to discern who's credible and who's not. And yeah. so, um, and, and the truth is, I'll be the first to admit, you know, you can learn, uh, like you just said, you can learn how to use Storyline and build those skills and not sign up for a program at all. You can mm -hmm. go download Storyline and learn Storyline for free if you watch enough YouTube videos and you play around with it enough. That's how I learned Storyline, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so at the end of the day, no matter what you do, I think it's important to remember that it's going to require work. It's not just signing up for a course or signing up for an email campaign or whatever the case might be. At the end of the day, it's gonna require a lot of hard work. Uh, mm -hmm. no matter what you do, right? It is. Yep. And I'd love teachers to know they really have a, a strong foundation to work from. Absolutely. And, and their their job, if they're interested in transitioning into the field, is to look at uh, the, the, the skills and tools that they need to acquire yeah. to fill out that skill set. 
Yeah. Well, good. Okay. So um, we're about halfway through and we have um, we have some questions in the questions pod. Again, mm -hmm. for those of you just joining us, you can put your questions in here and upvote on others. Um, and then we'll start tackling these. So let's tackle some questions, Kim. Okay. Our first question comes from Floyd. Hey, Floyd. And Floyd wants to know, can you tell us about how you translated your experiences in academia towards the work in uh, a corporation or a corporate instructional design? Was it challenging to convince a corporate corporation to respect your education experience. I have thoughts on this. I just I just had an epiphany about some of this stuff recently, but I'll let you start with this one, Kim. Uh, how uh, What challenges did you have about translating your experience or what tips would you give on that? Yeah, I, I think, uh, thanks for the question. I, I think it really has varied in, in my experience just to speak to uh, the respect of the, uh, the academic background. It really varies from person to person. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, be prepared for that. Um, and in terms of how the skills transferred in, I have found them to transfer in very, very nicely because of I spent so much time in a very heavy data driven district. We mm -hmm. really loved our data, right? And in instructional design, we would call that front end analysis, right? That's the, in a corporate industry type environment, yeah. that's that needs analysis where uh, we weren't doing the type of work where you're just teaching out of a manual and somebody's telling you what to say. We were doing that work that is the work of an instructional designer and learning designer in a corporate environment, which is identify in a corporate environment, it's identify the business goal, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and uh, where is the gap between that goal, that metric we want to meet and what people are doing right now? Yep. And what data, what's the data telling us about the reason for that gap? Mm -hmm. And then we begin designing our instruction. So that's the same type of work that I was doing. Um, and I was working at, you know, that strategic level. Yep. Um, so it has transferred very nicely for me, uh, a, a place that has been a, a challenge, uh, in that, in that, in the new environment is that the environment I came from, it's a foregone conclusion that we are going to be assessing heavily, looking at data heavily, and then making data driven instructional and curriculum decisions. And what I have found in some environments in industry or other areas is that step, uh, People sometimes want to rush past that step mm -hmm. and just say, hey, we've got a problem. People aren't doing X and we want them doing that. They're doing Y. So let's make a training so they'll do it. And they're missing that middle step. Right. <laughs> so convincing, uh, convincing sometimes uh, stakeholders to slow down um, and be very thoughtful about what we are going to design to teach yeah. has been a bit of a challenge sometimes. So I don't know if anybody else noticed what you just did right there, but mm. the, everything you just said is a great way to illustrate how what you would do as a teacher applies in a corporate setting. And this kind of relates to my epiphany that I've been thinking about recently. Talk, uh, when you go into an interview, you know in your gut what things are your blind spots or your weaknesses or the things that you're concerned that the hiring manager might question you on or have skepticism about your abilities on. And one of the things I've learned, I was just coaching somebody about this the other day who's going into an interview. And I told her, I said, you know, when you're in that interview and those things that you know that they're going to question or that are your blind spots that you know that they're going to know that, the sooner you can address it directly with them before they have to question it, it takes the power away from it. Like acknowledging, yeah, you know, in the school environment, this is how we did it, but this is how it might translate in a corporate environment. That's exactly what you just did. I don't know if you if you intentionally knew that you just did that, Kim, but that's what you just you did. You you said, well, this is how we did it in the school environment or in academia, and this is how it would imply in a corporate environment. That convinced me that, oh yeah, you get this, you understand those skills, and Absolutely. so so it's it's about tackling it front on, head on that. Yeah, there are things that you do differently in a school if you're a teacher, but it does apply in a corporate environment. Let me explain how, right? That's what uh, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I saw a question scroll through where somebody was kind of asking about that in particular. And I think uh, absolutely. And um, 
you know, one thing I didn't do before I left that I would maybe recommend to people is if you are in a very data heavy uh, environment, start collecting the examples of how you're doing that analysis and the decisions that you're making. Yeah. Uh, that will tie very nicely to the front end needs analysis and then the the, the gap, um, you know, analysis and then the design. And I completely agree with you, Tim. I That's the approach I took in interviews. Um, mm -hmm. It, don't try to hide it. Be very clear yeah. about your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, uh, I would say in mine, you know, I happen to work in a very tech, very tech heavy environment. Even though I have all of our instructional design tech fields, it really can't compare to the type of incredible level of technology that's happening constantly at Intuit. Yeah. And I was super clear. I bring analog skills. That's what I'm going to bring <laughs> to this <laughs> team. <laughs> there are going to be some ways that, you know, I, I'm, I am not keeping up with the technology here. And they said, oh, we understand that. We can help you with any technology questions that you might have. So mm -hmm. be very clear about that. Um, I would also be very clear about your experience with collaboration. Um, you know, it is calm and be aware of that if that's a blind spot for you and fill that in. Mm -hmm. um, in your skill set, it, it is not uncommon for university and K-12 instructors to spend a lot of time working on their own in a yeah. room. Um, and so I fortunately, over my decade of doing peer coaching and doing, you know, the work I did with the district leaders and my team and the classroom teachers was heavy, heavy collaboration work. So I was able to speak to that. If you have that you need to highlight that. And if you don't, you've got to start going and, to get it. And there's nothing wrong with being upfront about what your weaknesses are. It, again, it take it, it, the, the sooner you can acknowledge it before they have to question it, yeah. it, it shows the hiring manager that you're self-aware. And I will tell you, mm -hmm. as somebody who's managed people before, managed a team of instructional designers before, uh, self-awareness is such a strong commodity as an employee. I The employees I always loved the most who were self-aware about what they were good at and what they weren't good at and where they stood and what they're doing to address their blind spots or weaknesses. There's nothing worse than somebody who's not self-aware that they're not good at something. And so, so show them that you're self-aware that, yeah, I might struggle. You know, I haven't worked on a collaborative team before, but here's what I'm doing to build that skill set so it's not an issue for you, right? Um, so addressing it head on. Absolutely. And also it, it gives your, your hiring committee, you know, when, when, and, and I um, have been in panel interviews, right. Mm -hmm. Four hour interviews where it's a, a whole group of people with a bunch of different perspectives and questions. It gives your, your potential team a chance to make the decision. Um, Hey, can we can we fill in where you might have weaknesses that you yep. need to strengthen? That's not a problem for us. Yep. You've got what we need. We've got what you need. We will make a good team. Yep. And yep. being honest about that up front will enable them to make the decision as to whether you are a right fit for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Good. Thank you for that question, Floyd. Um, all right. <laughs> So our next one is, I think it's Liesl. Um, uh, hey, Liesl. Liesl wants to know, is it advisable to get a mentor to assist one with the transition from teaching to academia? Uh, yes. <laughs> but Kim, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, I, I think having mentorship and, and guidance is always advisable, yeah. really. Yeah. Uh, just... I mean, that's sort of the oldest model in the world, right? Yeah. Is the apprentice you know, apprentice to a, a practitioner model of teaching. And so having somebody who can guide you through that is is enormously helpful, I would think. And also a community. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that I, I've noticed, Tim, about what you have going on is the community of people who have knowledgeable leaders, mm -hmm. right? Um, yep. But also a community of people that they can talk about what they're learning with and try things with and just go through that journey together. Yeah. Well, I would say I thank you for that. And I totally agree. And the thing I would I would add to that is when you're looking for a mentor, don't find don't find somebody who's just going to be an echo chamber for you or who's going to just lament with you. Find somebody who's going to challenge you and challenge your what you're thinking, what you're doing, and is going to push you 
and yeah. uh, not just somebody who's going to agree with you or lament with you about how hard it is. Uh, a mentor is not somebody who's always your friend. A mentor is somebody who you can trust to push you outside your comfort zone. And, uh, and when they're annoying you because they're pushing you so hard, that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what I think a mentor is, is somebody who pushes you. And the other thing to remember too about mentorship is it is the job of the mentee uh, to drive the mentorship, not the mentor. So mm. pick somebody who's going to push you and utilize that person's time productively to, for you. Um, don't expect them to drive the relationship. I don't know. Do you yeah. agree with that, Kim? That's a really good point. It makes me think about what we were discussing in terms of just, you know, vulnerability and transparency in an interview as, you know, being able to really, if you have somebody who's mentoring you and coaching you, come to them and say, I'm struggling with this. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. Can you help me? That's what they're there for. Yeah. A mentor who just makes you feel good or just laments with you isn't doing you any favors. They're not, no. they're not helping you. No. All right. Good. I hope that helps Lisa. All right. So our next question comes from Jacqueline, Jacqueline Hiller. Hey, Jacqueline. Jacqueline wants to know, how do you feel like, uh, do you feel like uh, the degree was necessary for your transition to L and D into a corporate series? Do you feel like a degree is necessary to get an L and D job in corporate yeah. setting? I don't. I don't. Um, and that is why, you know, I, I mentioned before I enrolled in the graduate courses at University of Indiana and University of Maryland. And I thought, do I really need a third master's degree? Like, is that something I need to do and pay for? Right. Yeah. To explore this job path. Right. Yeah. So we have to keep that in mind. I was not sure if I was like, I'm going like, mm, to go back to being a, a, a literacy coach in, in districts. So I was still exploring. And I decided I was not going to commit to the full master's degree. What I did was found a program that enabled you to do half of it, mm -hmm. to do the, they called it the micro masters. It's just a branding for a, cert a certificate. It's common in master's programs that you can do a, the certificate and then you can continue, right? Mm. To do the full master's with the thesis and the research and all of that. So that's what I did. Um, and I did that because I didn't know if it would be necessary to have yeah. the master's degree to make that transition. And as I re as I looked into it, um, I did hear advice, and I don't think it's necessarily untrue, that if you are transitioning from another field, you want to have that master's degree because if you don't have the experience already, you're not being shifted into a training role, mm -hmm. right? If you're not already in, in, in a corporate environment, for example, and being shifted into that role, you're trying, you're coming in from another industry, um, then you need that degree because other people are going to have it. So when it comes to you or them, so I had heard that, but I thought to myself, well, I'm not fresh out of college. I'm not, you know, I, I have a broad and deep foundation already in instruction and design. Yeah. And so I think I'll just take the the half masters and start doing some freelance work and start creating and see where that takes me. Yeah. So uh, my answer is I don't think the degree is necessary. I do think you might want to explore the certificate process. But again, remember at university, the majority of what I've seen and heard is it can be very heavy theory based. Yep. So be sure to supplement that with the practical tools of the profession Yeah, and see where that takes you. You may not have to do a whole degree. Yeah. I've talked about this before. I totally agree. I've talked about this before. Uh, hiring managers nowadays, uh, the, and this is becoming more and more common in corporate settings, uh, they care more about what you can do right now, not just what you know. Um, and so, you know, uh, focus on the practical skills can you build a course and storyline? Can you do a needs analysis? Can you analyze data? Can you create a project plan? Can you have a kickoff meeting with stakeholder subject matter experts? Can you write a storyboard, right? Can you design a facilitator guide? Like those are practical skills. And to your point, Kim, a lot of the a lot of the degree programs don't focus on practical skills. They focus on theory and um and so the answer I give people is don't don't go spend thousands of dollars on a degree just because that's what society has told us, that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, if you're gonna go get a degree, 
that's fine. I encourage anybody to go get a degree if you know what your intentions are in getting it. If you're doing it just because you think that's what that's what we, you know, because that's what we're told when we grow up is we're supposed to go to high school, go spend thousands of dollars on a degree and then find a corporate job. But that's just not how it works anymore. Um, so, yeah, no. And I think to your point, I guess it, what I would say is if I had to say what's more useful and important for a transition like this, a degree in instructional design and technology or a portfolio that shows yeah. your ability to do the work, to really build, to really do that planning, to really do all of that, the portfolio is going to be more valuable, in my humble opinion, because it is proof of what yep. you can do. And I mean, uh, and I don't begrudge anybody who has a master's degree or a PhD. I think those are, that's, I mean, those are huge accomplishments, yeah. but I'll tell you from experience, I've, I've interviewed people and hired people who had PhDs and master's degrees and they couldn't perform the act of instructional design to save their life. <laughs> so, and we talk about this in instructional design. We, as teachers, as educators, we know knowledge and behavior aren't mutually exclusive. <laughs> uh, just because people know doesn't mean they can do. So focus on what you focus on building the doing and then, and then consider maybe supplementing it with the knowledge that can help advance your career in the long run. But making yeah. the transition, I would I would say, yeah, the portfolio is number one. So absolutely. Just like in instructional design, it's not that we want people to know things. We want them to do things. Right. right. So yeah. I would say your employer, your potential employer is looking at that in the same way. You know, yeah. what I want to know is what you can do with your knowledge, right. not just that you have it. Yeah. yeah. Good. Oh, thank you, Jacqueline. Jack, Jacqueline. I don't know why I'm having a hard time with that. Jacqueline. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, our next question comes from, um, I, I don't know if I'm going to get the name right because it's just the email, but uh, Silo Dina. We'll go with Dina. Uh, Dina wants to know, uh, where did you find support uh, regarding the language that highlighted your skills when you made the transition? So how did you find the support regarding the language? Like how did you, how did you translate your skills? What was the language you used? I, I think that's the question. I think so. I think I think I get it. Uh, you know what I did was just as I was going through those graduate courses uh, and other types of trainings, I the support came from myself. I guess I I thought to myself uh, th they're calling it this, uh, but it's this yeah. that I know, that I know how to do right. Yeah. Uh, you know, industry, instructional design, you know, experts, one that I was listening to give a talk about the, the comparisons between um, instructional design in industry or corporate and in academia. Um, you know, she's saying it's the front end analysis that happens in corporate that may not be happening, especially at a university level, because mm -hmm. the approach is totally different. Uh, that's not the approach a university is taking. And I just know that, okay, well, that's what I have already learned and done as data-driven decision-making, data-driven yep. curriculum design is what yep. I would call it. So I just made those connections myself along the way. Um, and then, you know, when I when I spoke to, to people in interviews for either my freelance projects or my full-time job or my contingent job that I had before this, Mm -hmm. I would pair those synonyms mm. uh, as it, as it was necessary and say, this is what I did in this field. It's called this. Yeah, I can do it. And that's the point. <laughs> I, I would say, uh, I would say in this instance, Google is your friend. Uh, if you're looking at a job description and they're saying something like, you know, do front end needs analysis and you're not sure what that is or how it translates, you know, most job descriptions are just full of buzzwords that those hiring managers heard somebody else say. So go take that buzzword, throw it into Google and what you'll find. And I just did a post about this this week. I did a video this week on this about like job titles, like the job title of instructional designer, e-learning designer, learning experience designer, uh, training coordinator. Uh, oftentimes those just mean all the same thing. Uh, it's just, we call them different things. Right. Right. Um, and so Google's your friend, like take those terms, Google it, and you'll discover that a lot of it's just semantics, you know, lesson planning and curriculum development are kind of the same thing, you know, uh, uh, a faculty meeting and a stakeholder meeting, you know, could be the same thing. Teaching, yep. facilitating, same thing. We just call them different things, <laughs> you know? That's, that's right. Or that workshop facilitation where my right. friend planted that seed. She said, you're doing workshop facilitation. 
with these teachers, um, showing them how to how to do yeah. it, training them on how to do it. And she said, We're, that's what we do in our corporate environment. We have these big workshops mm -hmm. and, that our trainers run. And so, yes, there are a lot of parallels. And to your point, Tim, a lot of it's buzzwords and, and a job description may be written by a hiring manager who actually may not even know what a lot of those things mean. So it's your oh, job to totally. you go to the interview. <laughs> And a lot of times those job descriptions are, uh, they might have been initially written by a hiring manager, but then mm -hmm. the recruiting and talent team edited into whatever standards they are. And a lot of times, I mean, this is one thing I've learned too, is like most recruiters, when you do that first initial call with recruiters, they have no idea what any of that stuff means. They're just making sure you're a sane person. I mean, so it's just <laughs> important to remember that those things are usually more often than not, it's just semantics buzzwords, Google them, and you'll find that it's far less complicated. Yes, and and, and take take the initiative uh, when you're when you get to speaking to someone who is looking to hire you to find out what it is that they need. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, for example, in an interview I was in, my, one of my it was to do a lot of um, VILT, virtual instructor led training, and transitioning during COVID from these you know, these workshops and these onboarding lessons that were done in person in the past now had to be done virtually. And so that I was brought in um, on a contingent contract to to work with that team and their in-house experts on on how on how to do that. And so, you know, one of my first questions was, OK, well, do we have you know, do we have our, our learning targets? Do we have um, you know, do do your instructors know what their learning objectives are. Um, yeah. And it's, well, we have topics, right? So ask, what what do you, what's going on? Why are they looking to hire somebody? And then find out if you can fill that need or not. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we have time for one more question. Uh, and I like this one. It kind of, uh, Jacqueline asked this earlier, but it has our most votes right now. And it was, um, I think it's a good uh, segue into one of our previous questions. So how do you find a mentor who will help you with your transition or your journey. Uh, here's what I'll say, and then I'd love your thoughts on this, Kim. Um, you know, uh, how do you go about finding a mentor? Well, I think the best thing you can do, if, if there isn't already somebody in your orbit who can help you or that you think is a mentor, I mean, spend time on LinkedIn and look at the people online that you admire. Find the people who are doing the thing that you want to be doing and then send them and reach out to them, send a really thoughtful message and reach out to them and connect with them. And you'd be amazed at the number of people out in our industry. Uh, myself, Kara North, I'm sure Kim has mentored people, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Oberlin, who, who's here with us today, um, uh, Aaron Chancellor, uh, Erica Zimmer. I mean, all of these people, Heidi Kirby, all of these people do mentorship for people in this industry. And uh, they give their time away for free. And the thing that that always kills me inside a little bit, or the thing that makes me so sad is when somebody reaches out to me and was like, hey, I would love to pick your brain, but I'm so sorry to bother you. You must be so busy, da, 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 da. And I always feel bad, like, don't apologize for sending a thoughtful message to another person. Um, I, I get dozens of messages from people today, uh, every day, where they send one-line sentences where they're like, teach me e-learning. And I'm like, and that kills me because it's like, well, could you put some thought into your message? And so <laughs> if you put some thought into your message and really send a thoughtful message, you'd be amazed at the people who are willing to give you their time. Um, yeah. That's my take on it. I don't know, Kim, how do you find a mentor? How, what tips do you have? Yeah, I'd agree with that. And also be prepared to talk about what you're already doing, right? Yeah. So if you're doing the work, you're really putting it in and you're you're looking for a champion, to, that somebody that can support you in what you're doing, not hand the, hand it to you. Um, right. To give you the answers, right? Yeah. Um, so I would say also uh, ATD, Association for Talent Development, was a great resource along my journey for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, you have your professionals networked into that in training and learning, and they're there uh, to, to guide and share their knowledge, experience, and wisdom. And then also it's, it's a great place to meet, you know, colleagues. Mm -hmm. So ATD is, is great for that. Um, and, and then I would just echo what you said, Tim, I, you know, look, look at, look carefully and long at, at the professionals that are in this space, look at how long they've been doing the work. 
um, you know, do they have enough history behind them to yeah. have accumulated the wisdom that you need from a mentor? Yeah. Um, and, and I would look for that as well. Yeah. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, before we wrap up, one real quick thing. Um, I know you mentioned the community. I, I invite anybody, if you're not already part of our, our the e-learning designers community, I just put a link to that in chat. Feel free to join us there. It's completely free. It's just a group of like-minded folks. Um, and we do, we're just starting to do monthly challenges and then we do Feedback Friday and we, we have a lot of fun there. So feel free to check that out. Um, Kim, thank you so much for joining me today. This was a fantastic conversation. Um, and uh, where can people like connect with you, find you if they want to maybe reach out to you or anything like that? Sure. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you. It flew by and yeah. thanks for all of the great questions, everybody. Um, and you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Perfect. That's, that's the quickest and easiest way to do it. Uh, Kim Denton. So uh, you'll see me there. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Kim. And uh, enjoy the rest of your week. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everyone. Bye.